Hello, everyone. My name is Hoala Grevy, and I'm the founder, CEO of Powbox. And I'm streaming to you today from a balmy Alaska, where it's 21 degrees Fahrenheit outside, making the most of COVID uh, during these times. Uh, when we launched Powbox in Honolulu back in 2015, our mission was simple yet audacious to become the market leader for HIPAA compliant email. For starters, we saw a vacuum of leadership in the vertical and we intended to fill it. Second, while it, seem, while it may seem like a niche within a niche, we saw vast opportunity within HIPAA compliant email. US healthcare, for example, remains hopelessly addicted to the fax machine with over 70% of communication still taking place via faxes. <clears throat> now during COVID, we've read story after story of healthcare organizations finding reams of paper spilling out of their fax machines. In fact, the long overdue digital transformation in healthcare appears to be finally upon us. Uh, since 2015, <clears throat> we've moved Hawaii, we moved from Hawaii and headquartered the company in San Francisco. We've acquired thousands of customers, maintained the net promoter score of 81, wrote thousands of blog posts, and consistently applied the narrative that we're indeed on the path to market leadership. <clears throat> now with our third annual Pawbox Secure Conference upon us, Pawbox Secure at Home, I'm announcing we have indeed arrived as the market leader for HIPAA compliant email. If you don't know much about us, here's how we got here. We did it through leadership, trust, compliance, and security. Now, when it comes to leadership, if there's a vacuum of leadership, a leader will fill it. From the outset, we intended to behave as the market leader. This meant hosting our own conference, starting a podcast, building social proof, and giving back. When it comes to social proof, we are now the category leader on G2.com for both email encryption and HIPAA compliant messaging software. In August, we joined the Inc. 500 list of fastest growing private companies in America. We also announced that election day is now a paid holiday at Powbox. In fact, we are shooting for 100% voter turnout within our ranks. Lastly on leadership, we believe the leader always gives back. Last year, we created the Powbox Kahikina Scholarship, whose primary objective is to encourage Native Hawaiians to pursue careers in computer science and software development. This year, we tripled our new scholarship recipients going from one to now four. In fact, one of them, Nick Wong, now works at Powbox and will be presenting later today at 310 Pacific. Trust, one of our main objectives this year was to provide clear pricing for all of our solutions. Simple objective, not so easy in implementation. In July, we consolidated our product line from five down to three solutions. In addition, we made pricing easy to understand by having it accessible via a single click. We also introduced freemium models for Powerbox Marketing and Powerbox Email API. In fact, we even include a business associate agreement with both paid and freemium accounts. Our aim is to build trust by having clear upfront pricing and easy ways to get started. On the compliance front, this year, we completed our high trust CSF interim certification and are now getting ready to undergo our two year recertification process. As you're probably aware, having the high trust certification means that you have the gold standard when it comes to compliance and regulatory frameworks within healthcare. And one of our sponsors this year, Beyond LLC, is also our high trust assessor. Uh, now, when it comes to security, I'm happy to announce that as of today, our big announcement for Powerbox Secure at home, we've added support for Transport Layers Security 1.3 to our entire Powerbox platform. TLS 1.3 is the newest and most secure version of the TLS protocol. And in essence, it provides unparalleled privacy and performance compared to previous versions of TLS and non-encrypted SMTP email. Upgrading our email infrastructure to support TLS 1.3, maintains our market leader position for HIPAA compliant email, 
And coupled with our high trust certification, customers can trust Powerbox to provide them with seamless, secure, and compliant email solutions. I'd like to thank our sponsors, High Trust Alliance, Goodwin, Beyond LLC, and HIPAA Ready. Uh, we're very thankful you're here with us on this journey. Now, without th further ado, I'm thankful for our keynote speaker and friend of mine, Jeremiah Grossman, to be kicking off things for us today. Jeremiah is the CEO of Bit Discovery, which gives companies a complete and current inventory of all of its internet accessible technology. He previously served as information security officer at Yahoo and chief of security strategy for endpoint security at vendor Sentinel One. He's also credited with founding the White Hat hacker movement in 2001, which is essentially a distributed army of professional hackers that seek out security flaws in the name of fixing them. Jeremiah has been featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and dozens of other media outlets for his expertise and insights. Companies like Google, Facebook, and Microsoft have acknowledged his work in identifying weaknesses in their systems. He's also a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and names off-road race car driving as his favorite hobby. And like me, he also grew up in Hawaii. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Jeremiah. Aloha. Thanks, Walla, and uh, good to be with everybody. And uh, yeah, the two guys from Hawaii were in cold climates. Uh, you're in Alaska, and uh, I'm right now in Boise, Idaho, with, um, as a consequence of COVID. But uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, to be keynote speaking for everybody here today. Um, the presentation I'm going to get into is going to be all about uh, asset inventory or, a, or external attack surface, if you want it. We're going to be very data heavy, and I can show you what is going on out there in the internet. It's hard to know the why things are the way they are, but at least we can start with the what. So let me, let's uh, let's get started with some slides here, and we can go into it. Let me uh, let me put these up on the screen here, and let's see here. View uh, one second. Make these slideshow format. All right, how are we looking, Hola? Good? Looking great. Uh, great. All right, so since uh, Hoala embarrassed me nicely with uh, my bio slide, let's not go over that again. So, uh, but yeah, I've been in information security a long, long time, mostly in application security, having founded White Hat Security. But more than anything, I like answering big questions and solving big problems. At White Hat, it was the application security problem. Websites have vulnerabilities. How do we find them at scale? The big problem I'd, I'd like to solve, um, you know, for the next generation of my career, if you will, is the vast majority of companies don't know what it is that protecting. They don't have an attack surface of their organization. They don't have an inventory of their websites, their mail servers, their DNS servers, nothing. It's like the first thing we should do as a sec uh, computer security professional, but it's like the one thing that we forgot to do in InfoSec. And I'm convinced that the reason we didn't do it or didn't do a good job at it is because it's really, really hard. And we'll get into that in, in a moment. Now, what I want to start the presentation with is talking about breaches. Um, now, you'll see lots of stats and lots of reports about breaches and vulnerabilities in general. There's one particular report, a new report that came out that's a little different than, let's say, the Verizon data breach report. This report here is uh, from a company called Coalition. They are a cyber insurance carrier of sorts, or at least they represent carriers and they sell insurance to businesses. Their clientele is about 25,000 small and mid-sized organizations. So the reason I like this particular report is that when there's a breach and there's a material harm and then there's a claim, they claim it uh, you know, to get paid back by coalition. So coalition, like the other insurers, has some really compelling uh, breach information that results in material harm. These are the breaches we should really focus on and we can learn a lot from. So when I pulled up this report, there are some, some standouts here that I wanted to share with, the, uh, with you all from the healthcare industry. So the first one at the top here is the annual claims rates in the first half of the year. What this means is in the top half uh, column chart is when there's a claim in the healthcare industry where let's say, let's put it this way, 2% of the healthcare companies have made a claim in the first half of this year, according to coalition. So 2%. So if there's a hundred of you on the call, 
two of you are, you know, so far going to have made a, a, a cyber insurance claim. There was a breach that resulted in a material loss. Here's where it gets interesting, though. A breach doesn't necessarily have to release confidential information or, or PI or PHI in this case to have a material harm. If you notice here, only 13% of the cases had PHI or some type of sensitive information. Most other ones didn't. So you can have material harm even though no sensitive data was released. And there's a variety of reasons for that. The next one I wanted to cover here is first on the right, how, how breaches happen and what does the adversary do? So you can see here the different types of uh, activities that are going on when the when a claim is made. But right here, when a breach happens, what is the type of attack? A good amount of them, 41% of ransomware. The second one is funds transfer. They're trying to steal money. And the other one is an email compromise. Here's where it gets really interesting is the how. How does the adversary break in? And if you're like me and you look at all the vulnerability reports, you know, you try to do vulnerability scanning and patch management, how are the bad guys actually breaking in? Right here, it tells the whole story. This big 54% bar, it's email and phishing. Half the time they're emailing you with something, you're clicking on it, get infected with malware and you're breached because of a phishing attack. Another 29% is having to do with remote access, RDP specifically whether they're brute forcing the RDP or it's wide open, and that's their beachhead on the network. Taken together, that's the vast majority of breaches are this, just those two vectors, phishing and remote access. Now, when we're talking about a uh, breach of email, 10% um, of the time it's healthcare. So healthcare is very much in the crosshairs as far as like a target for the adversaries that are causing harm. Now, we're not sure why, and I talked to the CEO of Coalition about this, but this was a very interesting stat that stood out to me and one that uh, I think is relevant to uh, Powbox. 3.2 times, organizations that use Microsoft Office 365 are more than three times as likely to experience a business email compromise when compared to Google Mail. We just know the what. That is what's going on. We're not exactly sure why, but that, it, but that is the what. And it leads us to answer more compelling questions like why is exactly, or how can we secure these systems uh, better for ourselves? Let's go over a couple of more here. Um, ransomware, that's a big one these days. So ransomware, the percentage of claims of, in ransomware, all the ransomware world, all the claims, 12% of the time it's in the healthcare industry. There's some very nice graphs on what the average ransom demand uh, is asking when you get, let's say, infected with Maze or NetWalker. In the case of Maze, it's 420,000 the adversary will ask for. Um, and then look at this real closely, the difference in the ransom demand overall, the averages between 2020 and of Q1 and Q2, they're going up, They've, they're increased 47%. So the extortionists, the ransomware purveyors are asking and demanding more. Doesn't mean that they'll necessarily get it, but the demands are going up and the price is going higher, not lower. All right, so now that we know the what is going on out there, now I wanna dive into asset inventory. I'm gonna show you all brand new data, stuff that's the industry has never seen before that we've never released before. First is asset inventory. Again, these are the ways the adversary breaks into the system. These are you know, how we find RDP, how we find open MySQL ports or default websites that haven't been secured yet. I'm gonna give you one proof point here that everybody knows of this breach, the Equifax breach. You know, Lots of consumers were caught up in this. Hundreds of millions of dollars uh, were lost in breach claims. Right here in the FTC complaint against, uh, the, uh, against Equifax, as the narrative goes, what you probably know about this is that Equifax didn't patch a particular system against a vulnerability that was known. While true, it's not the entire story. Equifax actually did patch that particular vulnerability on many other systems, not just not on the system that was compromised because they didn't know it existed. They didn't have a comprehensive vulnerability management program because they didn't have a comprehensive asset management program. If they knew that asset existed, likely they would have scanned it, likely they would have patched it. So how embarrassing does it get? I mean, as secure professionals and our job is to protect these systems, 
we don't want to be compromised while patching these systems and getting com compromised because we didn't know something existed. That's not something we want to have happen. But that's what's going on here with a lot of organizations. They're getting hacked on things that are entirely preventable only if they knew those systems existed. So where does uh, asset inventory find usefulness? It's useful if you have an asset inventory for yourself or others uh, across the gamut. Sure, for vulnerability management, you want to know what you're supposed to be scanning. You want to know what you're, you know, if you're signing up a vendor or a third party you're going to do business with, what do they look like? Of course, cyber insurance uh, likes, uh, third, uh, likes uh, asset inventory to know what they're covering and so on down the range. Asset inventory, if you have it accurate, if it's complete, it's very, very useful for a number of use cases. And again, it's, I find it to be the, the biggest and most important unsolved problem in the industry. So now what we're going to get into um, is our data. Um, I like to say we have about a, we have a copy of the internet. We have everything that Google doesn't have. So we take routine snapshots of the internet. We have about 200 right now from about and of stuff that we collect, stuff that we get it from other places, about 515 data sources. Um, I'm going to get into some of the definitions here, but we have about 115 columns of data. So you pick an asset on the internet. Well, how many things do we know about it? and collectively we're about 150 years of total CPU compute time. So in our entire database, what we know about the internet is about 4.5 billion total DNS entries. We think it's about 70 or so percent complete as far as what's actually out there on the internet. So we've been doing this for a long, long time. And the reason this data set is important is that now when we wanna know what a company owns, we don't have to go scan the internet for it on demand. We can just surface it out of our database because we're tracking it all the time. So now let's, let's get into the actual data, the inventory analysis. We're gonna focus on the healthcare industry and we'll name the companies and also uh, the hospital and health networks. Um, but we wanna start answering the questions like these, you know, how many websites do they have? How many are in the cloud? I mean, imagine asking the average healthcare operator, hospital system, what percentage of their IT environment, their public IT environment is in the cloud? How, wh what assets are standing behind an, F an F5 uh, load balancer? This would be very hard for them to answer. How many exposed RDPs are, do you have that you're aware of? We wanna be able to answer these questions for any organization, especially the healthcare industry and do so quickly. And finally, when I use the word asset, what I really mean when you boil it down, it's a combination between a DNS entry and an IP address. That's, a, that's an asset. All right, let's look into the actual data. Now, I'll remind you, I don't know why these numbers are the way they are. We collected inventories as far as what's out there on the internet, what do these companies own in total, and there's gonna be a margin of error here, maybe give or take 10% as far as margin of error, but they're all directionally correct. So I don't know why these numbers line up the way they do, I only know what. So the way to read this is HCA, the big uh, red bar has 104,000 things that we can somehow attribute to uh, being owned by HCA. You go on down the list, Ascension or Tenant, you know, about 2,000 or about 800 respectively and down the range. So if you're a, a hospital or a health network, you have an internet presence, you're one of the top ones, which these are, your median is just under 2,000 things. So you have about 2,000 things to worry about, to protect. So imagine if you're an adversary, what, I just have to be right once. I just have to find one weakness in one system at one time and there's plenty of opportunity to do so. Now let's look at the healthcare industry because the numbers are much larger because those companies tend to be much, much bigger. So in the case of the largest one, United Health, they have over 108,000 assets connected to the internet websites, mail servers, VPNs, staging systems, IOT devices, anything and everything that we can find on the internet that we can associate as being owned by them. Uh, Kaiser has about 70,000, CVS has about 43,000 things. All sorts of things that they may or may not be aware of. Now, that's total assets. Now we can start looking at things like domain names. Now, domain names are useful. And now with, um, with a lot of domain privacy and GDPR, this is getting harder and harder to do, is try to figure out what domain names are owned by a company owns. 
So these can be reasonably accurate, but they're never going to be perfectly accurate because not even the organization often knows what domain names they own. They don't know what assets they own. They don't know what domain names they own, but domain names are important because we want to find the subdomains underneath the domain names they own because it's a much easier way to associate ownership than it is by going by IP address. IP address to organization owner is very hard, if not impossible, because you can usually only tie it back to an ASN or who owns the net block, and that's usually not a strong enough tie. That said, HCA has about 5,200 uh, total uh, DN, uh, domain names registered, United Health about the same. You have other ones that will range between a couple of thousand or a few hundred all over the place. Some of these might be a little off, but we can get a sense for how big. These things tend to correlate. The more domain names you have, it seems the more assets you have, which makes sense. Now, as I mentioned, imagine asking a large hospital network, a large healthcare uh, insurer or healthcare provider, what percentage of their assets are actually in the cloud? And what I mean the cloud is uh, AWS, Microsoft Azure, App Engine, and others. Um, we live in a world where, you know, the last several years there's been Organizations are moving to the cloud. For some organizations, that's true. But from our research, most of the time, that's not. If you look at the numbers here, let's say HCA, about half of the thing, half of the assets that we can attribute to them are actually in the cloud. That's kind of amazing. Humana, even more amazing at 83%. But you have other ones that are like, like Kaiser, only 2%, or McKesson, only at 5%. Now, most every organization that we test has some a number of assets in the cloud, meaning they adopted the cloud, but they didn't necessarily migrate to the cloud. So they have the cloud also. In the case of Humana, HCA, Cardinal, it looks like they actually moved to the cloud, but their other ones, their peers, not so much. They adopted the cloud, but left the legacy systems exactly where they were. So this is a very useful data. So to see if you happen, if you're, if you're on the call here listening and you are employed by one of these organizations, do you know the answer? Like what assets do you have in the cloud? What the percentage is and how you compare relative to your peers? Cause that can be uh, fairly useful. And you might be surprised that, did you know you have things on AWS? Did you know you have things on Azure? On Azure? And a lot of times when we talk to organizations, they had no idea things were uh, all over the place. And, and, but who can keep track? I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of assets for the, a lot of these large organizations. All right, let's move on to CDNs. CDN is short for Content Delivery Network. Most of the time it has to do with speeding up performance to the end user, making the website or the system more responsive. And depending on this, the CDN, they could add a layer of security as well, um, like Akamai and Cloudflare do, and I believe Fastly does as well. So if you notice here, most of the hospital and healthcare systems, very few by percentage of their assets are behind a CDN. Um, but there are some outliers there. McKesson, 10% are behind, uh, behind a CDN, in which case I double checked into this one. It's va uh, the vast majority of the time, it's Cloudflare, probably to fend off against DDoS attacks. And that might be the same with uh, community health and common spirit. But most of the time with a, with a hospital system or a healthcare system, you don't need this, the general speed or the system to be close to the user, as you might say a retailer or a hotel network or even a search engine might. So that's probably why we don't see a large representation of CDNs amongst uh, the healthcare networks. When we're using CDNs, it's likely mostly be, we don't, we wanna fend off a, a denial of service attack. Mm -hmm. Next, let's dive into certificate authorities. So when you make uh, a TLS certificate, you have to get it signed by a CA, and then you can put it on your system, you know, to validate uh, identity, uh, identity of the organization. And a lot of companies have a lot of different CAs. So look at this for a second here. So a lot of the, these companies will have hundreds, tens of thousands, sometimes 100,000 plus assets. Each IT group uh, responsible for a collection of assets, you know, for each division of the organization, they might have their own go-to CA. So this is pretty revealing. So we have a lot of problems with keeping our certificates up to date. Well, it stands to reason because, you know, have a look at how many CAs the average organization is using. United Health has 106, HCA has 46. Even the smaller ones, like let's say Tenet and Trinity or Atrium, they have, you know, nine, you know, or in the community health, uh, 27. So 
there's just a lot of CAs to, uh, to keep track of. So it stands to reason that you'll lose track of certain certificates and they might expire. And now the way today's browsers work, that's when a certificate goes bad, you know, for whatever the reason, it just turns off the website. It's like a self-imposed DOS. So I'm not saying that you might want to uh, consolidate down to, you know, less CAs, but for manageability, you might. But we're just presenting the numbers out there. So, you know, if I look at Anthem, they have 45 different CAs that they work with. That's an amazing number. How do we talk about uh, certificate authorities and not talk about expired TLS certificates? On this number of systems with the push for TLS uh, system wide, at least across the web, in the case of Powbox, uh, definitely email as well. How often are uh, certificates expiring? This data is exclusive to the web right now. We're not, re we're not testing yet for it on other ports beyond 443. Um, we, planned, uh, we plan to do so, but not just yet. In the case of HCA, what we've been able to discern, they have something wrong with 97 certificates in, uh, in all of their network. But here's the thing, you have to compare their total number of assets with the expired cert. So when HCA has, I think, if I recall, roughly 100,000 or so assets, only 97 expired certs, that's pretty good. Same with Renited Health, 433 versus 100,000 plus assets, that's not so bad. But other ones, perhaps like McKesson or Cigna that have far less assets and far more expired certs, that's a security or an IT hygiene problem that they should uh, get on top of. Uh, better to pull these sites down than have an expired or, uh, or cert. Uh, some amount of these are self-signed certs where they're saying, I, I'll, I'm happy to trust myself, but other ones are just, they're failing in some way and they should be cleaned up. Now, yeah, here's the one that's pretty interesting. Um, we're talking about health uh, hospitals and healthcare systems. We're talking about healthcare insurers. These are the largest in both categories, the largest ones in the US market. Some of these might go more global as a geo, but they have systems hosted all over the world. Imagine that. Our data is going into these companies and they have hosting systems in all these different countries. In the case of HCA, which we keep mentioning, they have systems like we looked at their assets and they're hosted in 16 different countries by their GOIP. In the case of Cigna, 23, United Health, 20. Were they aware, you know, whatever the countries are, we, you know, um, for those interested, we can dig into the actual uh, countries, but we don't want to get too specific on any particular company right now. But they're actually hosting these systems all over the world in all different sorts of places. And we may not be aware of where our data is heading or the different regulations and the geographies of where it's sitting. These companies may not even be <laughs> a, a, aware of it, but we're just starting to expose these numbers and show this is what's happening out there. Should it be happening or can we do better is a completely different question, but we're, start, we're starting here first. Now, the last one, uh, second to last one, I should say, is private IP space. Um, private IP space, according by TCP spec, um, you can go by RSC 1918, there's certain IP addresses or IP ranges that are non-routable over the internet. But that doesn't stop DNS servers when you go something something foo.com resolving to an IP address that's on private IP space. These are mistakes that the DNS admin is making. And while you can't connect to that private IP, you, be, you become aware that it's there. It might be like dev system or staging system.company.com routing to a private IP space. So it gives the adversary intelligence on what's happening on the internal side of the network, even though they can't connect to it directly, they might be able to use a different vulnerability to land and get any kind of beachhead and then connect to that system that they know exists. So in the case of HCA, as far as leaking private IP space, 30. In the case of Tenant, 25, McKesson, 691. What we found is that these numbers are almost never consistent. They will change drastically uh, week to week and month to month as the IT environments change or the public attack surfaces change all over the place. What we find for most inventories for most companies, they change between one and 5% monthly. They might be, they add new assets, remove assets, uh, add new services like new listening ports, or they might remove them, or they might patch systems to add new you know, software versions. 
the asset inventory of the average company is changing all the time. And this stat particularly, if you if I ran this stat again two months from now, three months from now, they'd be all wildly different because everything on the network is in flux. And the last one, I wanted to give you a little bit of vulnerability information here. Um, for those that are not familiar with WordPress, WordPress is an extremely popular uh, open source content management system um, used worldwide for blogs. Tens of millions of sites use this. Uh, so highly popular. WordPress core uh, these days ends up being fairly secure if you keep it patched. Wasn't so much back in the day, but now it's, you know, it's fairly secure. Where WordPress gets a bad reputation has mostly to do with its plugins. Um, the admin will install a plugin, it could be one plugin out of thousands, millions, and a lot of times those plugins don't get updated frequently, and it's not exactly like they go through rigorous review. The other problem is if that if you're using a network scanner, and I'll just pick a couple off the top of my head, let's say a Qualys, a Tenable, Rapid7, you know, Nessus, whatever you want to use. Um, they generally will, they might scan, a lot of them will scan for WordPress vulnerabilities, but they won't scan for WordPress plugin vulnerabilities. So it's a, it's a hole they have in their system. Now you might think the application scanning world, which I'm from, the Y hat, Veracode, Synopsys, you know, on down the range, they don't look for these vulnerabilities either. The only real way, or let's just say the best way to scan for these vulnerabilities is mostly a do-it-yourself mode with something called WP scan. What WP scan does is it fingerprints for the presence of a plugin. It says, is this file here? Yes, then it's probably running this plugin of this version. They keep a database of vulnerabilities associated to version numbers. So they can detect these are the plugins and the versions that you're running. They look in their database, that's an old version, it's vulnerable to this. So when a system flags um, as being running WordPress, we'll enumerate its plugins and we'll have a look at what vulnerabilities will probably be reporting in that system. And then we ran some stats. So it's a long-winded response to explain this slide, but it was important. <clears throat> so to start simply, um, total median, not average, median number of WordPress sites for a hospital network, about 17. So they have about 17 blogs or content management systems of some kind. Healthcare systems, um, healthcare providers, because they're much, much, uh, healthcare insurance rather, they're much, much longer and larger in terms of overall assets. They have about 70 WordPress instances, whether they realize it or not. But look at the delta here. Total median number of WordPress vulnerabilities across the entire inventory of a hospital network. The total median number of web websites with at least one WordPress vulnerability or the median number of vulnerabilities per WordPress site, the hospital networks do really good for some reason. Now I looked into these numbers because I, it couldn't be zero. What happens is I was looking at about 10 companies or so there were two that had issues and the rest were really zero. Like they, they really did, they had very few plugins or those plugins were kept up to date. It was not the same in the healthcare industry. Um, their total median number of WordPress vulnerabilities, these could be simple vulnerabilities or low severity. They could be high severity SQL injection down to cross site scripting, you know, all sorts of things, but they had about 106 as a median. So just think about all those companies. They have about 70 WordPress sites and they have about a hundred, you know, perhaps unknown uh, WordPress vulnerabilities. Now, here's another way to look at the data, total median WordPress websites with at least one vulnerability. So five, that means five of the 70 or so WordPress sites had at least one vulnerability. What that means is a, a WordPress site tends to be really secure and well-managed or really not well-managed. There really is no in between. It's not an even distribution. There's somebody taking care of that WordPress site and doing a good job, or there isn't. So for the adversary, they're looking to find these five WordPress websites, and that will be the beachhead in. So now, when a WordPress website has a vulnerability on the average hospital uh, healthcare network, it will have about 16 vulnerabilities. So the adversary can use one of these 16 vulnerabilities to break into the system. So. That's WordPress in a nutshell in the healthcare industry. Um, I'll probably be releasing more similar uh, stats like this across uh, other major industries like finance and so on. But it gives us an idea, a little bit more vulnerability data that the adversaries are looking for because the adversaries aren't trying to score a, a style points to break in. They're just gonna find a way in. Um, I could go into RDP stuff right now, you know, for remote desktop. I don't wanna do that right now because that's, a hot issue right now. I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but 
um, this is WordPress. All right. Um, I'm not sure what time we're at, but we're looking pretty good. I think we're on time. Yeah, we're doing okay. We've got six minutes left. Okay, great. We'll go through one more slide, perhaps open it to a few questions if there's any. Some guidance. What do we do for here? I don't want to land you with a whole bunch of data and you're kind of like, okay, well, wow, it's a, it's a big job. I don't know what to do. What, what do I do? So having done this for 20 years, having read tons of security reports, interacted with thousands of companies, here's where it comes down to. You have to know, I mean, it's inarguable at this point, you have to know what it is that you're supposed to be protecting. If you don't have an asset inventory, get one. If you don't have a place to go get one, call me and I'll help you do that. Second one is uh, passwords are weak. Um, people get fished, you know, things happen. Multi-factor authentication will save you. Um, that's a huge one out there. This comes directly from coalition. This comes directly from the cyber insurers. Multi-factor authentication will save a company. Um, email security is right there on, on the list. Um, falls right into the box when I think it was 41% of how we're getting compromised is right through email. Email security has to rank right up there. This is a focus area. We protect this area. We solve a lot of breaches before they happen. Everybody gets compromised. Everybody gets breached. It's only a matter of time. Security can never be perfect. Um, you want to be able to detect the th these things fast and you want to be able to recover as quickly and as easily as possible. That means routine backups. This will save you in the case of ransomware so you don't have to pay the ransom. If you back up, you get ransomware, restore over it, make sure everything's good, save yourself some downtime, save yourself some heartache, save yourself a few hundred million dollars in costs and depending on the case, back up your systems. Um, wire verification, email will get compromised, two-factor off may not be set up, you know, set up a, an extra layer of wire transfer verification to make sure that the, when the vet, when the adversary eventually breaks in, they can't just wire all your money out without talking to someone first or having to uh, go through a couple of gates. All we're trying to do here is increase the cost and time of the adversary and increase their work effort in order for them to, to give up or for them to be noticed before really uh, uh, something bad happens. And finally, password management. You've heard it before. I feel strange having to remind everybody about it. Um, when a system gets compromised, when passwords are leaked on the internet, everybody races to ch change their password on that, one, on that one system. But what we wanna do is have different passwords on each different system. And then to the extent that we can enforce this, the better. So you wanna have a different, strong, unique password per system that we care about. And we have, wanna have multi-factor authentication on top. These are the basics. Now, the, I'm not saying the basics are easy. In fact, the basics end up being hard with systems this large, but these are the things we must be doing. Those that do this don't end up having to make a, a, a cyber insurance claim on their, uh, you know, to their broker, and you know, we don't get to read about you. And that's what we're trying to do as information security professionals. We're, we're trying to make our job almost inconsequential. We don't want anybody to know our name because that means something really bad has happened. These are the things, this is what I have for you. Thanks, Wallace. Jeremiah, big mahalo, man. That was incredible. A lot of stuff there I haven't read anywhere else. A uh, couple quick comments. Uh, one of the uh, companies you did research on, I've talked to some management there and verbatim, they're just, I don't wanna be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So to line up with your, the comment you just said when it comes to security. Uh, we've got two questions here, and I think that'll kind of conclude us for the opening keynote. First question, does the cloud offer greater protection over legacy clients? I guess that he means on-prem. It's a good question. It could go, honestly, it could go either way. Is the cloud more secure than on-prem? It could really go either way. I mean, the cloud is compromised in different ways than the on-premise environment is. What I like about the cloud, depending on if it's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, it ends up being at least secure as its most demanding customer. So that's one way to look at it. If you've <clears throat> come from an insecure legacy system and then you're moving to the cloud with all the same policies, procedures, and mentality, it probably won't be any less secure but it probably won't be any more secure either. So I think you can, you can make a really secure cloud environment or a really insecure cloud environment. And like everything else in security ends up being, you know, user error or operator error. Yeah. 
Yeah, we see a lot of that with email. I mean, that's basically what 